All right, welcome everyone. So I'd like to start with the uh, traditional land acknowledgement. Uh, I acknowledge that we are all meeting this afternoon from a variety of traditional and unceded territories across BC. I'm currently on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kukite First Nation here in uh, New Westminster. And I am very grateful to be able to work and learn here on this territory. Um, if you'd like to take a second to very quietly think about the territory that you are on. Great. Thank you to all of you who are joining us. Uh, my name is Christy Oxley. I am currently the president of the BCTLA. And uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Rebecca Rubio. Rebecca will be talking to us about uh, diversity audits in the Library of Learning Commons. Uh, Rebecca is the District Curriculum Coordinator for Library and Information Services in School District 38, Richmond. Uh, she is also a member of the BCTLA Executive Committee and uh, wears a number of other hats, including, um, uh, you know, I'm sure mentor and um, uh, too many things to, to mention. So we're, we're very, very grateful that uh, Rebecca is taking the time out of her busy schedule to go through this, uh, this webinar with us. So I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca. Okay, thanks, Christy. I'm mm -hmm. um, hoping everybody can hear me today. Um, this is exciting. I'm just looking at the numbers going up and up on the participant list. And I'm just, I'm stunned because um, diversity audits have been my work this year, since everything I'm doing this year is around diversity. And, and I thought it was just sort of a quiet thing that, um, that I was passionate about. And the more I talk to people about it, the more I realize, no, this is something that so many of us are asking questions about and, and wanting to do good work on. So I'm really pleased to be here today to just share a little bit of um, of our journey. So as Christy said, I'm the library coordinator for the Richmond School District. And this year I have invited my secondary teacher librarians and, their, and the library techs to engage in diversity audits with us. Um, and, and they have been fearless in this work. And so my goal today is simply to share with you our journey. I am in no way an expert. I have not done this before. We're in the middle of doing this. Uh, but there have been so many calls and so many questions from other districts that I, I said to Christy, why don't, we, why don't we have this as an open dialogue for, for everybody? So the plan today is to talk a little bit about why we would even consider doing a diversity audit, um, how we would do it, and what happens once you've done it. And having said that, I don't know what happens once we've done it because we're in the midst of it, but we do have some plans and I wanna just share our journey uh, with you today. So uh, before I start, I just wanna acknowledge a few really important people. Uh, this came on my radar last year when I was invited to uh, speak at a symposium at the Ontario Library Association. And part of the symposium um, was attending the conference as well. And I went to visit or to listen to Beth Van Tassel and Suzanne McLean, who, um, who presented, uh, their title was How White Is Your Collection? And I don't wanna say I stumbled upon it because I was very intentional in finding uh, pre uh, presenters in that conference that were talking about diversity and equity, but I did stumble upon this unbelievable archive of information. And so Beth and Suzanne presented their journey uh, with, a lot, with a diversity audit uh, and really, sparked for me a real curiosity and, and, and a passion to do this work here. And I've been uh, trying to bring that to our district. Um, both Beth and Suzanne also referenced Karen Jensen, who was, I think, one of the first ones to do a diversity audit in, in her library. And so I have gone back to her work quite a bit. And I want to make sure that she's acknowledged here because she was the first one to, I think, to really start cracking this. Um, and then currently this year, I've been working closely with Tony Duval, who I've never actually met in person, but who I speak to regularly now, who uh, is also in the process of doing diversity audits um, in the Peel District in Ontario. And so we have been sharing uh, a lot. And I, I want to make sure that, um, that her work is acknowledged here today. Leanne McCall is a teacher consultant in School District 38. She is my partner in facilitating the diversity audits with our um, secondary libraries. And then, of course, my biggest acknowledgement is our 
uh, teacher librarians and library techs here in Richmond who are actually doing the grunt, the, the brunt of the work. They are working really hard on the ground. They're putting in hundreds of hours. And so uh, I'm just I'm just so amazed at their their professionalism and their their curiosity and their commitment to this process. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, so first of all, I guess the question is, what actually is a diversity audit? And so a diversity audit is essentially a deep dive. It's going um, into your collection to do a really thorough review of inventory of what you have there. And the goal is to determine what kind of diversity there is in your collection. And it's important because what we're doing is gathering data. We often have a sense or a hunch about what our collection is like or what our programming is like. But when you actually drill deep and, and pull up the data, it can be surprising. It can also be a really powerful advocacy tool when you actually have raw data and say, this is what's in the library. These are the gaps that exist. This is how we need to move forward. So diversity audit is really getting deep into your collection um, and asking yourself, how diverse is it? And really the whole process is equity in action. It's really us saying if we value equity, we need to do the hard work, which is to have a really good deep look and see what's in there. So why, why would you even do a diversity audit? And you need to know it's a lot of work. <laughs> People have often said to me, oh yeah, yeah, just run the report for me. And, and I keep saying, no, 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 you've completely misunderstood what it is. We would do a diversity audit because as librarians, as teacher librarians in, in school libraries, we know that our libraries are democratic places and we know that equity and diversity and inclusion matter that has always mattered to us i think we're at a certain moment in history too where it seems to be even more important and more relevant that we um, pay attention to diversity and equity that we really ask ourselves whose voices are heard um, and who is represented in, in our collections. I love this quote by Rabia Kokar, who's another uh, young librarian in Ontario, who said that equity is not something we do every once in a while, but rather the lens through which we intentionally plan and carry out our vision of the school library. So when we are going and jumping in to do a diversity audit, we're essentially um, intentionally, intentionally thinking about equity and intentionally thinking about um, how, where it fits in our library collection. Um, so then I guess this next question would be then why is, why is diversity important in our collection development? And of course, it's because we have a responsibility to ensure that every single patron sees themselves in, in our collection, that every single student and adult that enters our building and enters our library can find something on those shelves that represents who they are, um, what they look like, what they believe, where they come from. Uh, we have a responsibility to, to do that and it's hard to do that if you don't really know what's on your shelves and so that's another reason why we think deeply about making sure that our collection is diverse um, in our conversations with our secondary teacher librarians in richmond we've been talking about the fact that a diversity audit really just shines a light onto our collections and asks us these really big questions have we made space for all the voices um, do we include underrepresented populations and do our collections reflect our current context and time and that's a really important piece because everybody's diversity audit will be different dependent on where they are who their kids are who their community is um, what you're looking for in your collection might be different than what uh, someone else is looking for in their collection that sentence in blue there is critical and we hold that up as we think about our diversity audit we come back to that statement all the time that we aim to dismantle the idea that the white settler able heterosexual cis male is the norm in other words do we have books that represent something other than this supposed norm do we have books that represent something that is not white or settler um, that has a di that have different abilities and so on and so on and so we keep coming back to that when we say what are we looking for in our collection when we're doing a diversity audit we're really looking to dismantle this idea of of a certain kind of norm as we're working we're constantly having to remind ourselves of um, our purpose whoops uh, because it's it's sometimes easy to lose sight of it our purpose is to think critically about equity and diversity and representation. Our purpose is to get a snapshot of our collections. 
so that we can guide our collection development moving forward. The key piece here is we're getting a snapshot. You are not doing a full inventory of every item in your library. That's an unrealistic goal, but you're trying to get a snapshot to understand to what extent is there diversity in your library and then to what extent um, do you need to, to think looking forward or what gaps you need to fill. I need to say that what we're discovering really is that yes, a diversity audit is equity in action because the data at the end is one piece, but the process is so, so, so important. And I'm very leery when I get calls from companies saying, oh, we can do a diversity audit for your library. Do you want us to run a report? And I say, it's not a report. This is not about running a report. This is really about deep, deep professional learning. Um, we're working as a team of 22. We have 10 libraries, each with a librarian and a library tech. And then the, the, the two of us that are helping to facilitate it. And we are going through a hard process. We're doing some deep anti-racism work and some really deep equity work. We are defining terms and spending a lot of time doing that. We are understanding concepts. We are challenging our biases and our deeply held beliefs. This is hard work. Uh, we're taking some hard looks at ourselves and, and, and wondering um, what biases we might carry or what beliefs we might uh, be bringing forward. And so a diversity audit is a really wonderful um, opportunity to work with colleagues and to think uh, deeply about diversity. And those conversations for me are the richest part. And, and I watch that among my colleagues as, as we're all working through and the questions that are coming up over and over again uh, and how we put our heads together and say, how, how do we as a group come to terms with this? And at the end of the day, we're gonna have data guaranteed. We'll know what gaps exist and how much we have of this and how much we have of that. But at the end of this, we will be different educators and we'll be different librarians. We will purchase differently. We will evaluate our, our resources differently. Uh, we will engage students differently because so much of that work has been the process, not just the data. Okay, so how do we do it? What, what are we actually doing when we are running a diversity audit? So we began with three big guiding questions. What's important to us here and now? Can we find that information? And what will we do with the information when we have it? That's why diversity audit is so unique to each community. I know that um, the women that I've worked with in Ontario uh, have a really strong focus around race, um, specifically looking at black authors and black identity, uh, because that is a, a large part of their population. In Richmond, our Asian population is, is quite large. And so when we start thinking about what it is that we need to gather, we're thinking about the students that we work with. So we have to ask ourselves, how responsive are we being to our school community? Are we meeting the needs of our learners? Who, who are we thinking about? Um, we're also thinking from a very practical and logistical point of view, can we find the information that we, we're looking for? And once we have it, what can we do with it? So those are some of the key questions. Uh, I'm going to show you just a, a quick flow chart of the steps of an audit, and then I, and then I want to take each one um, slowly. So first we need to set it up, we need to decide who's doing the audit, then we're going to set our markers, then we're going to determine our percentages. Then we will do the tracking. That's the bulk of the work work. Uh, then we will analyze our data and then we'll take some next steps. Right now in Richmond, we're at the tracking stage. We are about halfway through our tracking, uh, but it took us all of September, October, and November to do these first steps, which was setting our markers. And in fact, we've skipped the percentages step just because we needed to get started, but that's what we'll be coming back to this month. And so I'm now gonna break them all down so you, you can get a sense of what happens at each of those stages. So the first stage is the setup um, and you'll have to decide what part of your collection you're gonna audit, who's gonna do it, how many items do you need and how are you gonna track that? So for us, the part of the collection that we audited was our young adult fiction. And we chose several hundred items per library. Uh, the unique thing about the way we're doing it right now is that the data that we get is gonna be for each individual library. They'll know their own uh, data for their own school, but we will also have some data for the whole district, which will be interesting. We know that there are two people per site. 
um, and we know we set up a, a Google Doc to, to track our information. Now, if you're doing a diversity audit by yourself in your own library, you will have to adjust accordingly because it's work and it's, it's really not uh, work for one person. So it'd be really nice if you could partner with another library or find some colleagues in the building because it's the conversations and the dialogue that come along uh, that really make it rich. The second most important piece then is setting up the markers. Uh, and this is where I'm gonna spend the bulk of the time talking today. The markers are basically, what am I looking for? How do I define diversity? And then how am I finding that in, in the books that I've selected for my random sample? Uh, and so in our case, uh, this took us months. This took us months to get to a place where we said, yes, this is the data that we wanna gather. And it's been such a rich journey. So one of the first markers that we decided was really important was the marker of race. So we decided that yes, race was important. And so when we track, we're basically, we're taking a book and we are checking, we're tracking all of our markers for the author. And then we're tracking all of those markers for the protagonist as well. So we decided that yes, race mattered, both the race of the author and the race of the protagonist. And so that was one of our markers. It became really, really, really complicated. Um, we started asking questions. Okay, so if we're gonna do black, is that enough? Is black sufficient? Or do we wanna do black Canadian, black American, black African, does that matter? Is that data that we need? We had lots of conversations around that. Then we went to Asian. Well, Asian is massive absolutely massive and we have Southeast Asian. And, and so we spent a lot of time talking about what kinds of mark, how we were gonna determine race because Asian felt too big for us. Um, we also included Latinx, so that's Latino or Latina. So uh, from, from Mexico and South America and Central America, that also became complicated because some Latinos and Latinas are black. So you can imagine the conversation was very rich. We had conversations around whether we wanted to track uh, for biracial or multiracial. Um, and then our richest conversation, the most interesting one was after we had started tracking and some of the, the librarians and the library techs came back and they said that it felt wrong, that it felt really intrusive to dig, 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 to dig through websites and to dig, to find information about the author and that it felt invasive. And so we had some really powerful conversations around why it is we're so uncomfortable talking about race. And we had some really good conversations around the fact that we have perhaps as educators been told, you don't label, you don't label, we don't put people in boxes, but here we are forcing ourselves to use labels. And why is it different and why is it okay? So we've had lots of conversations around the importance of, of being able to talk about race and, and the importance of being able to uh, have these conversations and, and feel that it's okay to dig for this information because our purpose is to make sure that we are representing underrepresented voices. That dialogue would not have happened among our, our colleagues in a different context. This, this was an opportunity to have those really um, deep conversations about race. One of our next markers was uh, our Aboriginal or Indigenous marker. So we, um, we called it the settler marker. So we definitely wanted to track how many of our um, authors and the protagonists were Indigenous. And for our purposes, we separated, we had two markers. We had Indigenous Canada and Indigenous World because we did want to make sure that we tracked both of those to see where they were. Um, even then, there were lots of really uh, strong questions. There were some questions around, um, for example, if, um, if there's an Indigenous group that's American, but very close to the Canadian border, aren't those artificial borders? Is that really? So we started to have really st uh, good conversations around indigeneity and land. Uh, and again, opportunities to have conversations that we might not otherwise have had. We also included own voices as a marker. So own voices is a term um, that was coined by Corinne du Duvy, Duvy, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and it basically means that we are allowing authors from marginalized or underrepresented groups to write about their own perspective. So this is in response to um, appropriating other voices. So um, as we're tracking a book and we're identifying that perhaps the protagonist um, let's say is, is on the autism spectrum 
and the author was also on the autism spectrum, then we're marking that as own voices because it's an authentic experience from by the author and it's being reflected in the literature as well. So own voices is something that we're tracking as well, just to see to what extent, I mean, it's another way of saying authenticity, how authentic are those resources. Uh, we did exclude gender from our own voices determination because otherwise that would completely water down our data. That meant if a, if a female was writing a, with about a female protagonist, we would have automatically checked it as own voices and, and that would um, really dilute our data. So we kept gender out of own voices. We then um, again had some really fabulous conversations around gender and sexual orientation and gender identity. So for gender, we went on one of the, uh, the district surveys, which had identified he, she, and they as uh, gender pronouns. And that's how we are tracking. So we're tracking both for the author and the protagonist if they identify as he, she, or they. Um, and then we also have a SOGI tag or marker. So that is anytime the author or the protagonist um, identifies as anything other than that norm, which we identified at the beginning, which is cis and heterosexual. And so uh, again, this has also given us some really fascinating conversations. Uh, the most uh, tricky one that we dealt with just a couple of weeks ago, we said that the, the author is female, identifies as female, but has a partner who is transitioning from female to male. And the conversation that ensued around whether or not this qualified as SOGI um, was really quite fascinating um, and, and really important as we start to uh, really start thinking about identity um, as related to sexuality and, and, and gender orient and uh, sexual orientation. Another one of our markers uh, was the Muslim marker and I want to be really clear that this is not a religious marker. We used um, uh, Muslim as a marker because we were really addressing Islamophobia and we're talking about groups that are underrepresented or um, have been marginalized and we felt that it was important to recognize um, Muslim voices, Islamic voices, both in authors and in um, and the protagonists. So that um, that was also a long conversation about whether we wanted to include all religions. Is, is that something we wanted to track? And we really ultimately landed on this as our marker because we felt it was relevant to our current time and place. Uh, the last marker that we had was ability. Uh, and again, it became very apparent right away that simply to say abled, disabled was completely inappropriate and, and inadequate to do what we wanted to do. Uh, so we started thinking about what about if it's a visible or invisible disability that became complex. What do we do with addictions? What do we do with chronic illnesses? What do we do with allergies? What do we do with mental health or neurodiversity? We had some really good conversations around ability. And I think that this, um, again, this, this kind of work helps us to define really um, some important terms. So we landed on physical uh, disability and an invisible disability. Now, I don't know if these are perfect markers, uh, but that's where we landed because it allowed us a place to at least begin to track. I should say that um, these are not perfect markers and there's never going to be a perfect marker. These are the ones that our dialogues and our conversations took us to. And in Karen Jensen's uh, report, and I alluded to her at the beginning, she presents so many other markers. And I think they're very interesting to look at. They, they weren't relevant for our group right now, but I, I put them here because you'll notice that, um, that it starts to really uh, ask bigger questions. She got into things like family structures. Um, she talked about refugees and new immigrants. Uh, she also had as possible markers, and I'm sorry, I know it's tiny. I just wanted to get it all into one slide here. She talked about homelessness and the question of class or, or socioeconomic um, status and so on and so on. And you could see that you could go in many, many different directions. I'm only sharing the markers that we picked because they're the ones that worked for us. And that seems to be the, the data that we want to gather. But keep in mind that your audit is whatever data you feel is important for you to, to track. So that's the big step number two, which is 
coming to terms with what is important for you. What do you want to find out about your collection? Once you've done that, you need to set your percentages. In other words, you need to say, what's the, what are we aiming for? And so we haven't done this. We had to skip this step for a multitude of reasons. We're coming back to it. But then you have to ask yourself, okay, so where do we get these percentages from? So for example, you could go uh, on, just look at the Canada census and say, what percentage of Canadians are um, are, are black or indigenous or whatever your markers are and then use that as your percentage that you're aiming for. So let's say you do your, your audit and you find out that 3% of your authors are black, but 20% of Canadians are black, then that could be your target that then you would have 20% uh, black representation in, in your collection. Uh, like I said, we haven't done that yet. We are going to be doing that. And you can pull those percentages from wherever you think is relevant. It might be on a Canadian census. You might want to do it just um, for your province. You might want to do it just for your district. Uh, my only caution here is that um, I wouldn't do it, definitely would not do it for a school because you then get into some tricky pieces because if you have a completely homogeneous school, let's say for example, your school is 98% Caucasian, you can't really make an argument for having a 98% Caucasian collection. So when we're looking at diversity, we wanna look a little bit bigger, perhaps your community, perhaps your province, perhaps your country, but when you're setting the, your goals for what percentage of diversity do you want in your library? Um, I would go beyond my, the school because uh, that might actually tip you in the wrong direction. The next step after you have your percentages is to do the tracking and the tracking is the bulk of the work. So that's where you now take however many books you've pulled. So in our case, we picked, I think it was about 800 books per school. Uh, in hindsight, I think that's too many. I think that is not a necessary amount to get a random sampling. We could have put, picked less. Um, but then you're going through each book and you're literally going through all the markers. So you're saying, okay, so I'm checking this for race, then I'm checking it for gender, then I'm checking it for Soji, then I'm checking it for Muslim. And you're literally going across and just going check, 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 check. I'm doing it twice. I'm doing it once for the author and I'm doing it once for the protagonist. Um, I think it's really important to note that we're only doing protagonists, we're not doing other characters, because that also really dilutes your data. Uh, it's very possible to have a book that, ha that checks all the boxes for all of the secondary characters, but your protagonist doesn't check any of those boxes. And so we were very clear that we were checking for the protagonist and the author, but not any of the secondary characters. It also makes it an, an incredibly onerous task to try to track that way. I'm going to show you a very sloppy slide, but um, it's the only way I could show you how we tracked it. So it sort of starts here and then continues and then continues. So this is what our what our spreadsheet looks like: title, author, evaluators, initials, and then we go ahead and track for the author. The, these three are gender. Then we start getting into race. Then we have soji, physical uh, or ability. Then we have Muslim, and then we go into the protagonist, all of those same markers. So it's a very long spreadsheet, a Google Doc that goes all the way across. And you take your book and you simply go check, 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 next, check, check, check. And of course, because it's a, it's a, it's a Google Excel, actually, um, it tabulates it at the end. The last column is own voices, which we then check off at the end if everything seems to match up when you did the author and then you did your protagonist. And then of course we have a section for notes, just if there's any notes of things that we weren't quite sure about or just wanted to make a note of. Uh, and the notes section are actually filling up quite a bit with questions um, and thoughts as we go along. This seems like a small thing. It took us a long time to get our heads around how will we track this? So once all the schools have gathered all of their data, then I will go in and from a district level, start looking at how, how do we tabulate this? What, what have we discovered about our secondary libraries in our school district? Um, how much representation do we have um, for gender, for race, uh, for ability, and so on and so on. Where do we find that information? Um, this is from the librarians themselves. They're telling me that these are the places that they're going. They're going to Goodreads, they're going to publisher websites, author websites, social media, they're going to Twitter accounts. They're definitely going to ERAC, Focus Ed. They're looking at different reviews. Um, they're digging deep and some books are taking them an hour to find the information. Some of them are very fast. 
Um, sometimes they've come back and said, it feels invasive to do all this digging. Should we do this digging? And our collective response is, yes, it's important because if we really want to see where the diversity is, we've got to dig and find out. We had a really interesting conversation about what to do when it seems that the author has not disclosed information. So if the author has not openly said that they are Japanese, but is evident that they are Japanese, do we track that? And um, one of one of our my colleagues had such a had such a wonderful response, and she said, for a lot of people, it hasn't been safe, or hasn't been a, a proud moment to disclose that you are Japanese or Indigenous or gay or whatever it is, because we're dealing with, um, in many cases, um, underrepresented and perhaps marginalized groups. They maybe are not self-disclosing information for fear or shame or many other things. So we had some really important conversations around why that is. Um, and we also had an interesting conversation around why it is that someone who's Caucasian does not ever say that they are Caucasian. They don't see themselves as having race. So I know I keep harping on the fact that our conversations are rich, but I think that that's where um, I find that the tremendous strength in this is, is in our equity work. We are in the midst of this. We're about two thirds of the way. When we're done, we will get our data, um, imperfect as it is, because we know it will not be perfect data, and we will start to anal analyze it and examine it. Are the results close to the diversity percentages that we set out? Uh, where are the gaps? What stands out? What do we see now in hindsight that was perhaps problematic? Um, what are we gonna do with, with this information now? In the end, this information is for us. So if I'm the, one of the librarians in the Richmond School District, I've done this data, I've, I've gathered this data so that I know what my collection looks like. And it's not a reflection on my work and it's not a reflection on my professionalism and it's not to identify any weaknesses in my, in my practice. It is purely where are we right now? What's in my library? How do I move forward? And so that's what the analysis piece will give us. In our case, we're gonna be able to analyze both individual schools and uh, the entire district. I imagine for most people, they'll be just doing a, a diversity audit on their own site. So it will be a, a little bit smaller and a little bit more contained. But in any case, once you've got your numbers, you've got to look at them and say, so what? So what do these numbers tell me? So what do I know now? What we are finding as well is that in the process, as we are doing um, this audit, we're weeding like crazy because we're pulling the books that have been, you know, that we've randomly selected and going, oh, I, I, I don't even want this on the shelves. And so an interesting piece that might come up as well in the analysis at the end is how much did you weed? Because um, as you were starting to do your diversity audit, you really realized now that doesn't belong here anymore. It should, it should go, it's not a, a good representation. The last step is next steps. So now that you've got the data, what do you do with it? Are you gonna share it? Are you gonna have a, a new plan for acquisitions? Um, are you gonna think about having a second diversity audit? I know that a lot of the TLs I've spoken to in Ontario started out with one part of their collection. So maybe they just started with their graphic novels and then they were moving to their picture books. Um, others have said that they only did um, a, a, certain, a certain year gap. So they only did like, let's say from the last 10 years because they figured everything before that would not fit the diversity audit. So sometimes thinking about it would be like, what, what do we wanna do next in terms of, do we, do we audit a little bit more? How do we share this information? What does it mean? Can we use it for advocacy? Can we use it to advocate for more funds? Can we use it to advocate um, in other ways? So, our next steps probably, and again, I say this probably because we're still in the midst, our next steps will likely be some form of sharing, whether it be with our staff, other TLs, um, the district. Uh, it will definitely change our purchasing. I know that already. I already see our teacher librarians purchasing differently because they're, they're, they've got different things on their radar now. Um, some of them were saying that moving forward, they're gonna involve students more in their book selections because it is ultimately the students who they are reaching to make sure that they have proper representation. Um, they're weeding, they're weeding now and they're gonna weed more as they move forward. Uh, there's also been some interesting conversation around uh, putting pressure on publishing companies because the reality is 
that even if we identify, let's say that we are really woefully um, inadequate in our Asian authors, there might not be a lot of Asian authors out there for us to purchase. And that is not, um, not because there aren't Asian authors, but it's often because the publishing companies who are the gatekeepers are not always letting in who we want to see. And so teacher librarians do have a responsibility to put pressure on those publishing companies and say, we need diverse lit, we need diverse voices, we need more of them, we need more quality diverse literature, uh, because we've got gaps in our collections and we can't fill them even if we want to. Um, so that's another, um, that's another interesting piece that's going to uh, perhaps shape what we do next. I know that this is also um, after our audit, like I said already, we could advocate for different forms of funding uh, in order to fund these collections because if schools are really serious about equity and schools are really serious about diversity and inclusion, uh, um, what we put in our libraries, what we offer to our students and to our staff uh, need, to, need, to, need to line up with those ideals. So, um, I know I have, I have talked for a significant amount of time, but I also want to make sure that we leave time for some questions. Um, uh, before I, I stop, I do, I do just want to say thank you for all of you for coming and, and listening. Uh, I think Christy is going to stop the recording now, and I'm happy to take questions because uh, I'm sure there are lots. I'm seeing some questions popping up in, 